Hi everyone, hope that you're all safe and well. You know, as this uh, coronavirus pandemic has now uh, extended into 10 plus months, one of the YouTube sites online that I found myself uh, repeatedly uh, clicking to, it's a music video of an old popular song uh, from the year now, 1988. But the song is called The End of the Line. The End of the Line. This song was performed by a then uh, music supergroup called the Traveling Wilburys. And they were comprised of legendary musicians, songwriters, uh, George Harrison, Bob Dylan, Roy Orbison, Jeff Lynn, and Tom Petty. Now, this song was a perspective about life coming from five then aging rock stars, all of whom had lived uh, hard and fast lives, and of the five, three are now deceased. And in this video, they're all on board uh, this one-way train that's headed for the end of the line. The shared perspective of the song was to not take life for granted, not take life for granted, to be appreciative for both the good and the not so good turns in this life, to not be concerned about one's material possessions, seeing it as a statusy thing, and also not to be overly concerned regarding others' opinions about you. Because at the end of the line, which represented death, it was approaching. It was fast approaching. Now the song itself is uh, a rather upbeat song, but it's not a very hopeful song in terms of life outlook. Because again, the perspective was once we all reached the end of the line, death, then that was it or that's all, folks. As we continue our study of the Gospel of John, we now encounter a, a real dilemma in this earthly life, which is death. It's one that we'll all face someday, our earthly end of the line. But what is not seen in that uh, music video and looking at our passage uh, today there was a great miracle that was about to take place beyond what anyone at that time or even the majority of us could ever hope or imagine. And as we look at this passage of scripture, may we see in Jesus' teaching and also in the upcoming miracle what truly sets him apart, uniquely apart from all other religions, all other gods, as the Lord Jesus personally dealt with the last enemy, also known as death. Our passage is taken from John chapter 11, uh, verses 17 through 37, a portion of which was shown at the beginning of this message video, but let me read it for us. John 11, verses 17 through 37. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now, Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now, God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. 
The one who believes in me will live, even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she replied. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. And after she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary aside. The teacher is here, she said, and is asking for you. When Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet entered the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who had been with Mary in the house, comforting her, noticed how quickly she got up and went out, they followed her supposing she was going to the tomb to mourn there. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him? he asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. And Jesus wept. And then the Jews said, See how he loved him. But some of them said, Could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? So the setting of our passage it, takes, it took place in the Judean village of Bethany. Bethany was located approximately one and a half miles east of the great city of Jerusalem. The Lord Jesus was very familiar with this village because he and his disciples often stayed there. And one of the main reasons was a family who lived there. They stayed at their home. The family consisted of two sisters and a brother, Martha, Mary, and Lazarus. From last week's message, we found out that Lazarus had become very ill. So think coronavirus with complications type of ill. Lazarus was so sick that the two sisters sent an urgent message uh, to Jesus telling him, the one you love is sick and hoping that he would come to Bethany right away. But what we learned also from last week's message was the, Lord, the Lord's timing is far different from our sense of timing, our human timing. So instead of leaving immediately, Jesus and the disciples stayed an additional two days where they were at before heading to Bethany. And we learned that the Lord Jesus, the Lord God, operates not by chronos time, our human time, but instead operates by kairos time, which we refer to as God's opportune time. The Lord Jesus told the disciples, Lazarus' sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. And also from last uh, time we learned the Lord God's plans and purposes are so much greater, so much greater than our human limited and small plans and purposes. So from a human standpoint, looking at the Lord's greater plans and purposes, it's like our looking similar to our looking to the Rose Parade, looking at the Rose Parade in Pasadena, but only through a tiny knot hole in a wood fence. So we just see a very small, limited perspective. And the Lord Jesus, he wanted to make known just as important as this miracle that he was about to perform in Bethany, just as important it was for his disciples to be there with him 
and to see this miracle, this great miracle unfold for themselves so that they would believe and trust in Jesus. And again, the Lord's greater uh, and higher plans and purposes. So as Jesus and the disciples now uh, approached Bethany, were at the edge of the village, what spiritual truths regarding death, the supposed end of the line, were about to be revealed? Well, a couple of truths that we'll unpack. The first one is this. Jesus came to comfort those who grieve and mourn. The Lord Jesus came to comfort those who grieve and mourn. Now, in the first century Judaism, there was a myriad of beliefs about the afterlife. This, that they included these. Much of uh, the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible, assumed that the dead, they existed in a type of shadowy underworld, which was not hell, but it was called Sheol. Sheol, S-H-E-O-L. And Sheol was a place where their spirits existed, but it was a place where the dead did not praise the Lord. From Psalm 115, verse 17. Then there was the belief of the Jewish aristocratic leaders, also known as the Sadducees. Now, the Sadducees denied a future afterlife altogether. So they did not believe in any type of afterlife. They believed that the soul, the soul perished along with the body at a person's death. That was the belief of the Sadducees. However, many Jews did believe in a future resurrection of the dead, a future resurrection of the dead. And they included the Pharisees, the Pharisees, the Jewish historian Josephus, the biblical writers of the books of Daniel, and also the wisdom of Solomon, also known as Proverbs, and also uh, the writers of the Jewish Mishnah. And at this uh, future time of resurrection, those who had died, they would be raised up to life again by the Lord. And they would then govern nations, rule over people, and the Lord God would reign over them. At best, but at best, this view of resurrection from the dead, it was very unfocused and very imprecise. From our passage, as Jesus and the disciples were just outside of uh, the village of Bethany, and when word of their arrival soon came to Martha, we're told that she went out to meet the Lord while her sister Mary remained sitting in their house. Martha, upon meeting the Lord Jesus truthfully, but also regretfully said this, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know, but I know that even now, God will give you whatever you ask. And Jesus responded back to her saying this, Martha, Martha, your brother will rise again. And to those words, Martha then revealed her understanding about the afterlife. And she said, I know that he, speaking of her brother Lazarus, will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. In the resurrection at the last day. So she had this future unknown time resurrection of the dead. Martha would then confess her faith and her belief in the Lord Jesus as the Messiah, as the Son of God, and also, she would confess her belief in the gift of life, this life beyond the grave given to all who trust in him. 
However, and there's a big however, Martha's belief in the promise of the resurrection of the dead, again, it was for this unknown, unknown time, the seemingly distant future, the last day of judgment. And that was similar, again, to so many of her fellow uh, Jewish uh, sisters and brethren at the time. But the Lord Jesus had a surprise in store. Again, this miracle, upcoming miracle, not for some distant future date, but for that very day, for that very day. And that's why Jesus proclaimed to Martha the powerful, wonderful, and comforting truth of who he was, his identity, saying this, I am the resurrection and the life. I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. And Jesus then asked Martha the question, do you believe this? He was about to prove it. And after Jesus had said this to Martha, we're told that she returned to the family home and told her sister Mary, the teacher, the rabbi was here and he's asking for you. And Mary then got up and went to the place where her sister had been and where Jesus and the disciples still remained. She fell at the Lord's feet and weeping, weeping in her own grief for her brother, echoed the familiar words of her sister Martha. She said, Lord, if you had been here, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Jesus then saw, we're told, Mary weeping, and also this group of uh, other Jewish folk, friends or extended family, who had come along with her, and they were there uh, to comfort the sisters in their grief. They were also weeping. And scripture said that Jesus was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. And more on that later. And when Jesus asked where Lazarus had been laid, his body had been entombed, they replied, come and see, Lord. And then came the shortest verse in our Bibles. We're told that Jesus wept. So tears literally came from his eyes. Jesus wept. From this passage, we learn much about the Lord Jesus, the God of the Bible. We here are all familiar with grief. Grief is the emotion the deep sense of sadness and loss for someone that has died, someone that has touched our life. Grief is part of the human experience of this fallen world. Death is a result of that fallenness. And death is a part of this short, temporary, earthly life that we all live. Grief, again, is the natural response to the loss of a loved one, be it family, immediate family or friend. Because this void, this emptiness is created because that beloved person is no longer physically here with us. And a similar word, to mourn, to mourn. To mourn is to be in a state of intense or deep grief. So mourning is an even more intense state of grief. So Jesus' response through both his words and his actions, they show that the God of the Bible, he is not some distant God. He is not an uncaring God. Just the opposite. Just the opposite. Because the Son of God walked this earth as a human being, he lived and experienced what all of us have experienced. The Lord Jesus is the God who truly sympathizes with us. 
sympathizes with us. And sympathize means to perceive or to understand and react to the distress and the pain of another person. Again, Jesus is the God who truly sympathizes with us. We see this in this passage where he listened with his heart to the pain and the distress of these two sisters. We see this as he understood and felt their pain. He felt their pain. The grief overwhelmed him. And in response, Jesus wept with them in what death had done to this family. So Jesus is the God who truly sympathizes with us, and he's also the God who comforts us. Who comforts us. Comfort being to lessen or to relieve one of the sadness and the sorrow and to help lift up another instead with hope. That is what it means to comfort another. And we see this in the passage where the Lord Jesus offered this safe place, this place of refuge being himself where the two sisters could go in the darkness and the pain of their loss. They ran to Jesus. We see this as the Lord Jesus allowed Martha and Mary to cast their grief, to cast their mourning upon him because he would and could carry their burdens. And we see this in the passage as Jesus provided for Martha and Mary a real hope. A hope they could look to to help them through their season of grief. And that is the promise of the Lord Jesus, the God of the Bible, for all of us as well, who believe and who place their faith in him today. Jesus offers to us that similar safe place, refuge that we can go to, that we can run to when we're faced with the darkness of loss, the darkness of death. The Lord Jesus also allows us to cast the weight of, the weight of our grief, the weight of our mourning upon him. And he will likewise carry our burdens. And the Lord Jesus provides for all of us a still real hope, a hope we can look to to help us through our seasons of personal grief and loss. The Bible, in fact, reminds us of the great truth of our Lord's great comfort from the book 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion, and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles, including death, so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort that we ourselves receive from God the God of all comfort. So remember, remember, Jesus came to comfort those who grieve and mourn. And a second truth revealed through our passage regarding death, the end of the line, is this. Jesus came to show, to show that God's power, it was even greater than the power of the grave. So again, Jesus came to show that God's power was even greater than the power of the grave, the power of death. As we begin this new year 2021, in some ways, it seems like a grim continuation of the past year. Coronavirus deaths in our state, our nation, as well as our larger world, continue to steadily climb. And the numbers, the numbers now stand at this. In the state of California, topping 
28,500 deaths. So 28,500 plus deaths and rising. In the United States, that number of deaths from coronavirus now stand at 350,000 plus. So again, in the United States, 350,000 plus and counting who have lost their lives to this virus. And worldwide, that number stands at 1.9 million people. 1.9 million plus people. So death's reality from this pandemic, still paramount, still fresh in our collective consciousness because we see the numbers every day. And it's a sad reminder that in this earthly life, nothing can be said to be certain except death and taxes. All of us, all of us have memories, whether recent memories or maybe uh, a longer time ago memories of loved ones, again, passing away and dying and the memories of going to the cemetery. And I think we can all remember as the casket was being placed into the ground and then the dirt is placed over and the flowers were then placed upon the now dirt covered grave of experiencing or feeling death sting, death's permanence. My introduction to death's cold sting and its apparent permanence came at a fairly young age my grandfather's death when I was uh, seven years old and shortly after that unexpectedly and tragically my older brother's death when I was eight years old. Death was the reason the Lord Jesus was born into our world. That is why he came to conquer, to vanquish death and to show that God, the Lord God's power was even greater than, even greater than the power of death, the permanence of the grave. From our passage, death and burial in the Middle East of uh, Jesus' time, the first century, it usually took place on the very same day that the person died because of the hot climate. The deceased person's body would be carefully wrapped in strips of cloth along with expensive spices and ointments to dress the body because of uh, the decomposition and the smell that came with it. Jesus was thought to have begun the journey back to Bethany either the day of or the day after Lazarus' death and burial. So by the time the message of the sisters came to him, Lazarus is sick. The one you love is sick. He had already died. And because the journey back to Bethany took one to two days worth of travel, by the time Jesus reached Bethany, Lazarus was believed to have been dead and entombed for approximately four days which the Apostle John noted. Now, Jewish tradition of that time taught that a person's soul, their spirit, hovered over the body for three days after death. And the reason for that was in hopes of being reunited with the body. So after three days, after three days, decomposition, set in. The body began to decompose and to smell. And after three days, there was no denying that a person was dead. So in Jesus' interaction with Martha and Mary, we see his reaction, the Lord God's reaction to death, the enemy of death. In his conversation with Mary, Jesus is described as deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Deeply moved in spirit and troubled. 
Now the meaning of the word used for that is angry or agitated or indignant. This was Jesus' reaction to the deep grief that he saw coming from Mary, this deep grief, this deep mourning. Jesus was angry, a righteous anger at the terrible, the tragic results of evil, of sin, and of death. He was angered by those things. And in his conversation with the more stoic, but the still grieving Martha, the Lord Jesus, he points her to the truth of who he is. And again, the accompanying miracle, this upcoming miracle, which was about to take place. And then he asked her, he said this, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die, and whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Martha, do you believe this? And for Martha, Mary, as well as Lazarus, as well as for the disciples, their faith and their belief, and also for those in that group of mourners who had come to the family home, and especially for the ones who said, could not he, Jesus, who opened the eyes of the blind man earlier, have kept this man, speaking of Lazarus, from dying? It was also for their faith, their belief as well. Something was about to happen. Something that only the Lord God could do. What was going to happen would show that death would no longer win. That death would no longer be the so-called end of the line because the Lord God was more powerful than the power of the grave, the power of death. And the cause of death for all humanity, all human beings, the cause being sin, that was about to be taken care of shortly at the cross by Jesus' own sacrificial death. A death which would pay in full or atone for the penalty of sin, and that penalty being death. So the good news, the good news, the great news of what happens when anyone places their belief and their trust in the Lord Jesus is this. Their sins are forgiven, paid in full by Jesus' blood that was shed at the cross. Their once broken relationship with God has now been restored. They have been given a new life. We would call it a fresh start, a new beginning to live life, but now with the Lord God. And though this side of heaven, this side of heaven, their short earthly life will one day come to an end. Each one of us will one day physically die. Physical death is not the end of the line. So again, physical death is not the end of the line because of what the Lord Jesus did. In fact, at that point, life is only beginning. It's the beginning of an eternal lifetime with the Lord God and a change of address, a change of location to a place called heaven. The Bible refers to our Lord's uh, victory over death from Isaiah chapter 25, verse 8, a prophecy speaking of the Messiah, speaking of the Lord Jesus. He will swallow up death in victory, and the Lord God will wipe away tears from off all faces. 
So again, Isaiah 25, 8, he will swallow up death in victory and the Lord God will wipe away tears from off all faces. Why does all of this matter? Why does all of this matter? Well, last night I was struck by this comment, this true comment that came from retired Dodger great, the pitcher Oral Hershiser, speaking on the death, the passing of his uh, beloved manager, friend, mentor, and baseball father, the late great Dodger manager, Tommy Lasorda. And Tommy Lasorda, uh, he had just passed away a couple of days ago at the age of 93. And speaking about death, Oral Hershiser, who is also a follower of the Lord Jesus, he said this line, this comment matter-of-factly. This is a day, the day, speaking of Lasorda's and our earthly death, that's coming, that's coming for all of us. So again, in this earthly lifetime, death is coming for all of us. But that's not the end of the line. That's not the end of our stories when we have this personal relationship with the Lord Jesus. Death will one day come for each of us during this short earthly life. But again, because of what the Lord Jesus did on our behalf over 2,000 years ago, for those who place their trust, their belief in the risen Jesus, Death no longer is something to be afraid of, no longer something to fear. So again, death is no longer for the Christian, something to be afraid of, no longer something to be, something to fear. And let me close our time uh, with a story, a story from the website Family Times. The story is called Not Afraid to Die. It's a true story uh, that comes from uh, the man named A.M. Hunter. And he was born in 1906 and died in 1991. A.M. Hunter was a devoted follower of the risen Jesus. And by vocation, he was a professor and scholar of New Testament theology. He is also the author of uh, many Christian theological books. And in one of those books, Dr. Hunter related a then true story of a then dying man who asked his Christian doctor to tell him, to tell him something about the place to which he was going upon his earthly death. And as you can imagine, as uh, the doctor fumbled for a sensitive reply to give to this patient, he then heard a sound, what was a type of scratching at the door to the office, and that was the Lord's answer. The doctor said to his patient, do you hear that? Do you hear that, the scratching sound? It's my dog. I left him downstairs, but he has grown impatient and he has come up the stairs and he hears my voice from behind the door. Now my dog has no notion, no idea of what is inside this door, speaking about the office, but what he knows is that I am here. And isn't it the same with you? The doctor said to the patient, isn't it the same with you? You don't know what lies beyond the door, the door of this earthly life. But you do know, you do know that your loving master, the Lord God is there. And 
that was enough. It was a reassurance that all believers need as we pass from this shortly, this short earthly life to the glorious eternal one that is waiting beyond. Let us pray. Thank you, Lord, that you are Lord of all. Thank you, Lord, that you are the resurrection and the life. Thank you, Lord, that you triumphed over the grave. And because of that victory over death, for all who believe, death is not the end of the line. Death is not the end of the line. And please, Lord, help us and anyone who struggles with the immediacy of death. And for all those who grieve or mourn because of death, to receive your great comfort and compassion. To receive your great comfort and compassion and to experientially know, to experientially know that your power is even greater than the power of the grave, even greater than the power of death. Lord, we are just so thankful. We ask all of these things in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thanks, everyone, uh, for uh, watching and listening to this message video. Uh, please stay safe and well in the midst of uh, this ongoing pandemic. And uh, we'll see you next time. Lord bless.